Welcome back, this is Dr. Jin Sung, where clinical excellence meets excellent results. I'm very excited to deliver this lecture. We're gonna talk about infections, whether it's viral, bacterial, or parasitic infections. How do we distinguish what type of infection that you might have? I highly suggest you stick around till the very end where I give you my clinical pearls. Here we go. Infection, bacteria, virus, parasites, white blood cells. So you can test in the blood what we call a complete blood count and with differential. Within that differential, you're gonna see white blood cells. So white blood cell or leukocytes are made up of two different types, granulocytes or and agranulocytes. Granulocytes are neutrophils, basophils, eosinophils, which are produced in the bone marrow. And agranulocytes are monocytes, lymphocytes, which monocytes are produced in the bone marrow, lymphocytes are produced in the spleen, thymus, tonsils, appendix, lymph glands. Now, you need all the organs that you are born with, right? So don't randomly remove your tonsils or don't randomly remove your appendix. If you can keep them, keep them because they're part of the immune system, okay? Here we go. White blood cell. We're gonna give you what we call conventional lab values and these are what we call functional lab values, what I consider optimal, okay? White blood cell, 4,000 to 11,000, okay? Uh, functionally, 5,000 to 8,000. Neutrophils, 35 to 70% is your conventional lab. Functionally, 40 to 60%. Lymphocytes, 20 to 40. Functionally, 25 to 40. Monocytes, 2 to 8. Functionally, 4 to 7. Eosinophils, 1 to 4 below three functionally. Basophils, 0.5 to 1%, below 1%. Now, I'm gonna go over each individual ones when they're elevated or decreased, right? They're not perfect in terms of, you know, accurately diagnosing a problem. We're gonna give you clues as to what might be going on, and then if you need to, you need to follow up and do advanced testing to figure out exactly what the problem might be. But this will give you clues as to what type of infection you might have. Now, this board is written up and it, there's a lot of information here. So let's go uh, step by step, line by line. When you have a decrease in white blood cell count, your leukocytes, your total white blood cell count, if you have a decrease, it can be related to a chronic virus or a chronic bacterial infection, okay? Other reasons why it can be decreased, it's immune suppression like HIV, AIDS, autoimmune disease, lupus, decrease in bone marrow function or bone marrow suppression, antibiotics, pancreatic insufficiency, even a raw food diet could decrease your white blood cell count. Pancreatic insufficiency is about where you don't have enough of the digestive enzymes and sometimes the white blood cells will take over that process of what we call phagocytosis or breakdown of the foods. So white blood cell can be depleted if you have pancreatic insufficiency. White blood cells that increases, right, above lab levels, even functional levels, means acute infection, inflammation, allergies, even pregnancy at the late stages or giving birth, your white blood cell count can go up and it will calm down after you give birth. Tissue damage, muscle tissue, it can be surgery. So you can have an increase in white blood cell count. Increase in neutrophils can be related to bacterial infection, inflammation, okay? A decrease in neutrophils can be bone marrow suppression or viral infections. With viral infections, you're gonna have an increase in lymphocytes and a decrease in neutrophils at times. Lymphocytes, when they're increased, can be an acute viral infection, 
can be inflammation. When lymphocytes are low, it can be a bacterial infection or a chronic infection. It can be oxidative stress. Monocytes. It's elevated when you have end-stage infection, so you're getting better. And monocytes are things that come in and they clean up what's left over. So at the end of an infection, you can have an increase in uh, monocytes. Sometimes it's associated with intestinal parasites and benign prosthetic hypertrophy in men, okay? Monocyte decreased could be related to steroids. Eosinophils that are elevated is related to asthma, intestinal parasites, allergies, whether it's food or environmental, okay? Eosinophils that are low, steroids or adrenal dysfunction. Basophils, increase with inflammation and intestinal parasites. So that's a lot of information, right? There's a lot of ups and downs here, but I'll step away so you can actually see this board and you can have an idea of what's going on. So here is the clinical pearls. If you see a elevation, let's say here, white blood cell count is elevated and you have an elevation of neutrophils, that is an acute bacterial infection. When you see white blood cell count with increase in lymphocytes, that's an acute viral infection. Oftentimes with acute infections, where you have elevation of white blood cell and neutrophil lymphocytes, you're gonna have the opposite with the other factor. So if you have a bacterial infection, you're gonna have an increase in neutrophils, and initially, you might have a decrease in lymphocytes. Same thing here. If you have an increase in white blood cells with increase in lymphocytes, that can be acute viral, but you can also have a decrease in neutrophils right in here. Number three, a decrease in white blood cell count with an increase in neutrophils. That's usually a chronic bacterial infection. The key here is that you have a low white blood cell count. So someone asked in the comments, how do you know if you have a chronic infection? You have a low white blood cell count with an increase of the marker that's elevated for the type of infection you might have. In this case, bacterial. Over here, you can have a decrease in white blood cell count with an increase in lymphocyte. That's a chronic, chronic viral infection, okay? So these are just general rules, clinical pearls. Here's the last one. If you have an increase in monocytes, an increase in eosinophils, there can be a high probability of intestinal parasites. Okay? So this little section right in here can help you determine whether you have a, an acute or a chronic infection, whether you have a virus or a bacteria, or a intestinal parasite. So this little chart right in here gives you an idea from a very simple blood test to determine if you have an infection. Now, like I said, it's not a perfect way of an analyzing this, but it gives you a great uh, first step as to discover what the underlying mechanism might be. So if you see that your white blood cell is low and you have slight elevation of neutrophils, there could be bacterial overgrowth. So you might have to go and discover or dig to see if there's bacterial overgrowth somewhere, maybe in the GI tract, right? Or if you have increase in monocytes and eosinophils, parasites, then you might have to do a stool analysis to see if there's infection in the GI tract. Usually monocytes, will be greater than seven, and eosinophils will be greater than three with parasites, all right? So that's my clinical pearl. I hope this was a, uh, a fun lecture and an important lecture, really, for all those people who have infection. Today, we're gonna to talk about parasites. What are they, how do we get them, how do we treat them, and how do we prevent them, okay? so. On the board behind me, we have a list of different parasites. But basically, a parasite is anything that is living in our body 
that is detrimental and has no benefit to us. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at the list. We're looking at roundworm, hookworm, pinworm, giardia, tapeworm, enteramoeba, lice, bedbugs, Lyme disease, H. pylori infections, right? All these infections that can create a detrimental effect on our body with no benefit, right? How do we get these types of parasites, right? Before I even talk about that is people don't realize there's so many people who actually have infections, right? As high as probably uh, 60, 70, 80% of the population will have some sort of parasitic infection and they, really, they don't realize they have one. So how do we get them? Water, right? Usually this is more of um, uh, countries that are of poor sanitation, poor water supply, etc. Uncooked meats, pork, even fish, so forth, you can get parasitic infections. Oral fecal route, basically runoff water that you drink, or that's in your food um, that has fecal matter in it, right, from animals. Pets. People don't realize that pets can transmit parasites, anything from roundworms to H. pylori infections. So oftentimes these, uh, let's say dogs, uh, are brought up in these kennels with other dogs, and maybe the conditions are not quite sanitary. And oftentimes they will pick up things like roundworms. And that's why they test um, new puppies, right? They do a stool pathology test to make sure they don't have any parasites. So pets are a big transmitter of parasites. Right? If you let your dog run around and they sniff everything, lick everything, and then you are saying, oh, the saliva is really clean. Let, let them lick your face, your mouth, your eyes, etc. right? Parasites can be transmitted by pets. Polluted waterways, lakes, overgrowth, etc. Feet. I've had actually one patient who got a parasitic infection through the feet, through the skin, right? They were on some beach on a remote island um, and there were parasitic um, bugs in the sand and it transmitted a parasite through the skin where she, it would open up cold sores, uh, uh, sores in their legs, and so forth. So, it can be a transmission through the skin and insects, right? Obviously, you know a lot of different viruses and, and things like the Lyme uh, disease, uh, which can be transmitted by insects or bugs, right? So these are all different things that can happen um, in terms of modes of trans uh, transmission. When we look at our symptoms, right, there are so many symptoms related to parasitic infections. And oftentimes what happens is you go to your physician and you complain about a symptom, you end up with a medication. They don't put one and one together and say, huh, this could be a parasitic infection sometimes. So look at the symptoms, right? So the obvious one is things like acute vomiting, diarrhea, nausea, right? Or it can be a change in your bowel movements, a sudden change. All of a sudden you're constipated. All of a sudden you're, you have loose stool and diarrhea, right? Unexplained fatigue or malaise, constantly tired, no matter what you do. Got 10 hours of sleep, I'm still tired, right? Sleep disturbances, you toss and turn, right? You might wake up at 2 in the morning and 3 in the morning, can't go back to bed. Now, that can be a symptom of blood sugar, but it can also be a result of a parasitic infection. Itchy skin or rectum. Pinworms are, are notorious for itchiness around the rectum, right? Especially with kids. So they'll get a pinworm, uh, the pinworms tend to come out at night, uh, in the middle of the night they start to scratch and the rectal uh, itchiness can be related to pinworms. Uh, unexplained itchy skin is very common with parasitic infections. Unexplained health conditions, things like fibromyalgia, pain, I don't know why I have pain, right? Fibromyalgia can be inflammatory, it can be as a result of an infection causing inflammatory response, causing pain. People who grind their teeth at night, right? Like they never used to grind, but all of a sudden they're grinding their teeth. Sugar cravings, or even uncontrolled appetite or food cravings. Constantly hungry, right? Parasites are feeding off of you, making you um, calorie deficient, basically. So you start to crave sugar. 
You start to crave food all the time, right? I'm hungry all the time. Another one is anxiety and depression, psychiatric disorders, right? Things like Lyme and other infections that can create inflammatory responses affecting the brain. So anxiety and depression is one. This is another one, autoimmune disease. Now, I have many videos about autoimmune disease, autoimmune thyroid, etc. So I want you to go ahead and, and, and watch those videos. But essentially, autoimmune disease can be triggered by a parasite. Why? Because parasites create an inflammatory response, a cytokine storm. It creates an environment where the body's immune response is uh, robust. And sometimes it can trigger an autoimmune disease where your immune system starts to attack your thyroid or it can start to attack your joints like rheumatoid arthritis, right? So there are many conditions that can be autoimmune conditions that can be related to a, maybe a parasitic infection. Anemia. Iron deficiency anemia is notoriously common in parasitic infections. Things like H. pylori, but you know, worms, larger worms, tapeworms, etc., can create issues with iron absorption and iron depletion, right? Because they are using your iron, right, to fuel their body. So iron deficiency anemia can uh, certainly occur, which causes what? Fatigue. So these are all things that we look at when we look at parasites, right? So when we look at it, we have all these symptoms. So how do we test for it? Right. We can test it in a variety of different ways. We can do an endoscopy, a colonoscopy. You can do a, a swallow of a camera that can look at your, your colon, etc. Right? And this is not going to be the best test because oftentimes these uh, microbes are small or these eggs are very small of these parasites. So therefore, um, the colonoscopy, endoscopies, and these cameras um, are not the best way. But sometimes it will pick those up. The best test for us is stool testing, right? We have a company called GI Map. Um, it's called Diagnostic Solutions, and they provide a DNA analysis of your stool, looking at all the different parasites, looking at all the different uh, microbes in your body, looking for blood, looking for uh, inflammatory processes. So a GI Map would be a good test or a good starting point. You can do another test called GI Effects through Genova Labs. They have a three-day test where you can look at the three-day collections uh, of stool so you don't miss anything. So these are different tests you can do. You can also do a blood test to see if you have an immune response or an antibody to a certain parasite. So blood testing is also a viable way to check for these. In terms of dietary changes, low-carb, low-sugar, no milk or dairy, no gluten. Right? Basically, parasites like... Uh, sugar, right? So you want to kind of starve that out. So you want to minimize the sugar intake. Gluten and dairy are all inflammatory anyway, so we want to eliminate those. So dietary changes. And then eating things that are high in things like garlic, ginger, those types of things can also be an anti-parasitic um, way of doing things. Remedies. So in our office, what we like to do, or what I like to do in our office, is when we have a confirmed case of a parasite, we want to do two weeks of a GI support and bile salts or gallbladder support. So many times when patients have a GI parasite, it's already doing damage to the gut. and They can't tolerate the anti-parasitic herbs and so forth. So I like to do two weeks of support for the GI tract along with the gallbladder, followed by an anti-parasitic regimen, right? So a GI support can be things like glutamine, aloe vera, extract, right? Uh, a probiotic and maybe digestive enzymes, right? Prepping. And then a gallbladder support, because you want to make sure that gallbladder is functioning well and is dumping the toxins uh, when you have a kill-off of the bacteria or the parasite. So we want to do two weeks support followed by antiparasitics, which can be woodworm, black walnut, garlic, clove, oil of oregano. So these, these would be my top five, right? Oil of oregano, there's a company called Biotics Research that makes a great um, emulsified 
orga uh, orga oregano oil, uh, which is time released, so it gets down lower into the GI tract. Uh, this is a fantastic way of doing it. And then you obviously berberine, olive leaf extract, and there's a lot of antimicrobial type of supplements out there. What I suggest is most patients who do this is to take a combination pack, not just wormwood or black walnut, but a combination of things to really go after a parasitic infection. And the time frame is really a minimum of four to six weeks. I prefer six to eight weeks uh, in terms of trying to kill off a parasitic infection. So how do we know it's gonna work? You can retest down the line. Maybe you do a regimen of six to eight weeks, wait three weeks, and then retest. Or you look for symptomatology relief, right? All those symptoms of anxiety, itchy skin, etc. right? So what I'm going to do is I'll link, link some of the supplements below, uh, different companies, etc. And you can go ahead and do a search on those. But it's important to make sure to prevent that from coming back. We talked about, you know, the sanitary issues with pets and, and water supply and etc. right? In other countries, um, parasitic uh, cleanses are done probably once a year. They use, often use medications, right? It's a very common thing in Asia and, and some other uh, third world countries is to do a parasite cleanse because uh, they know uh, between uh, raw foods and um, water supply, etc., that parasites are inevitable. So you want to go ahead and make sure you do those things to help yourself. So if you have unexplained symptoms, Right? And instead of ending up with an anti-anxiety medication, uh, something for your diarrhea, something for itchy skin, dermatological cortisone creams, etc., think parasites. Sometimes that is the underlying mechanism. Today we're going to talk about chronic pain and the four mechanisms that I think are very common or missed in chronic pain patients. So let's get right into it. Pain. I think parasites, food, xenobiotics, and gut function. Those are the four mechanisms that are often overlooked with pain. Parasites. Patients come in, they have infection, worm infections, or they have fungal infections, things like candida overgrowth, or mold infections because they live in a building that has um, a toxic mold growing and they have mold spores. Bacterial infections, uh, anything from H. pylori infections to other lower GI infections that can create chronic inflammatory responses. Viruses are very common. Epstein-Barr, right, uh, is one of those infections that can impact your thyroid. Uh, Epstein-Barr can be very chronic and reactivated uh, oftentimes. Other viruses like shingles virus can also create pain in the nerves. Um, so there are many types of infections that can create um, chronic pain issues. We're not talking about pain where you have a very degenerative knee and it's bone on bone type of pain. We're talking about migrating pain. You can have pain in your knees, or your elbows, your shoulders, your muscles, right? It can be generalized pain throughout the body. SAD stands for a Standard American Diet, right? It's a fitting acronym. SAD, it's a SAD diet. When we look at your standard American diet, it's highly processed. It also has a lot of artificial colors and preservatives. Gluten and dairy is very prevalent, and gluten and dairy tends to create inflammatory processes in a lot of patients. So oftentimes when patients do come in, we would put them on an anti-inflammatory diet, minus gluten and dairy, right? Also high sugar. Standard American diet tends to have higher levels of sugar uh, compared to, let's say, dietary fiber or protein. So when we look at your standard American diet, you know, if you go out and you get first thing in the morning, you get a, let's say, a croissant sandwich or a donut with a coffee with extra cream and sugar. We're spiking our insulin first thing in the morning, but you're also getting gluten exposure uh, and dairy exposure. So your standard American diet leads to, let's say, having lunch, and you have a slice of pizza with a soda, okay? And then dinner, you're in a rush, uh, you'll pick up whatever uh, from the local store, 
and it's pre-packaged and you throw it in the oven and you have it. So those are the types of things that can create inflammatory processes. So standard American diet is not really a healthy diet for a lot of people. Xenobiotics, these are things that are uh, environmental things or things that you put into your body that should not be there, right? Or your body is not uh, used to accommodating these types of things. So xenobiotics can be any types of drugs or medications, pesticides, herbicides, uh, is, it's very prevalent in all the food items. So it's best to go to either local farms uh, where they use minimal pesticides, herbicides, or go organic whenever possible. Food additives, we talked about cosmetics. Um, a lot of young children or women uh, will use a lot of cosmetics, right? Uh, underarm deodorants, uh, things that they put on their face. And these things will absorb into our system, creating an environment where uh, the body has to detox these things out. Industrial and environmental pollutants, uh, very common also. Uh, the smokestacks that are releasing heavy metals, uh, things in the water, uh, plastics, huge, huge uh, problem. Right? Um, there are recent studies that show that uh, most people will have small uh, microparticles uh, of plastic in their body, right? And they'll also even find it in drinking water at times. Obviously, they're on fish and some animals because they're eating plastics or microplastics um, and it's getting into our system, okay? Gut and liver function. So some people could have, let's say, an infection, like an H. pylori infection or gut infection, but because they have very good stomach acid or uh, gallbladder function, their digestion is very good, they have a very diverse diet with high... Uh, vegetable or plant fibers, um, they could have an infection and if they have a really good healthy gut, they can have no symptoms related to that infection. However, if you are uh, having a standard American diet, right, and then you have a lot of xenobiotics in your system and then you get another parasite or an infection, then all of a sudden your gut is not doing well, right, and it's creating problems or a low-grade inflammatory process that can linger and then naturally will impact joints and muscles where you when you can get uh, development of chronic pain. Now also liver function is well, very important because your liver is responsible, responsible for detoxing our system. So if you get exposures to foods and xenobiotics and, and chemicals and other things that go into our body, your liver needs to work extra hard to basically detox that system. So when I say gut and liver, I have most patients in our office, or I recommend most people to do two uh, cycles of this every, uh, every year, meaning a gut and liver protocol. Things to help heal the gut and help the liver detox to a certain extent, uh, you should do it twice a year. So a healthy gut microbiome is very important to minimize pain, and you have to re remove inflammatory foods, and then you have to increase vegetable fiber, and you have to improve fuel for your colonocytes or your stomach lining. Things like butyrate, propionate, acetate. These are all very crucial uh, nutrients to help the gut microbiome. And then you also need heavy liver, uh, healthy liver detox pathways to clear out these st substances. So if you want to manage chronic pain, you're going to have to really think about this and ask yourself, where am I getting exposure to this? Can I change my diet? Can I do a gut cleanse or a liver cleanse to help myself? There are a lot of different products out there, but what I'll do is I'll link uh, some protocols for gut and some protocols for your liver. And I highly recommend you do it twice a year with the advice of your medical doctor or your physician who understands you know the medications you might be on so we don't want to have interactions with medications so you want to be cautious with that so definitely talk to your physician about it but i'm going to go ahead and link uh, some common protocols that are utilized for gut and liver health and you should go ahead and try that and then eliminate this diet right in here you want to be able to eliminate and just eat clean protein, vegetables, and fruits uh, during the detox phases um, to help yourself 
and see if it's going to make an impact on joint pain or muscle pain or things like chronic fatigue syndrome and so forth. Today we're going to talk about the seven benefits of taking berberine. So let's get right into it. Berberine is considered a metabolic master switch. It helps to regulate lipids, glucose, and energy metabolism. So it's great for things like high cholesterol, hypertension, as well as glucose management. So number one, insulin resistance and diabetes. It helps to reduce fasting glucose, your first morning glucose after fasting, and your hemoglobin A1C. Your hemoglobin A1C is typically the two to three month average of blood sugar. Likely it will also decrease your fasting insulin. Number two, hypertension. Helps with vasodilating the blood vessels and relaxing the smooth muscles of the blood vessels. So it helps to just kind of relax. It's like a muscle relaxant, right? For the blood vessels. Number three, high cholesterol. It's been shown in studies to decrease total cholesterol, LDL, triglycerides, and increase HDLs. So it balances out your lipids. Number four, it helps with yeast and candida overgrowth. Now there's so many people who use uh, prolonged use of antibiotics or frequent use of antibiotics due to sinus infections, UTIs, you name it. They do a lot of prescriptions for antibiotics. So a lot of people will get yeast and candida overgrowth. Berberine is shown to attack the cell membrane in breaking down the yeast or candida overgrowth. Number five, PCOS, or polycystic ovarian syndrome. This is a syndrome where there's insulin resistance in women and there's an increased level of testosterone. So it helps to manage insulin resistance and menstrual irregularities because most women who have PCOS uh, might skip a month or very irregular in terms of their period. Number six, SIBO, or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. People don't realize that SIBO is actually the number one cause for what they call IBS. Now there is a test called a three hour lactulose test that you can take, and it will show you if you have an overgrowth of either methane or hydrogen gases, which is diagnostic of SIBO. Now there are other gases other than hydrogen and methane, but the test is testing for hydrogen and methane in the lactulose test. Now, it's been shown in studies to be just as effective as rifaximin, which is the antibiotic they would use to treat people who have SIBO. So what they do is they did a three hour lactulose test pre and post, and it showed that berberine was just as effective as rifaximin. I highly recommend people taking the rifaximin along with the berberine to get a better benefit or better outcome with SIBO. Weight loss, great for metabolic syndrome. Women who are in their 40s have the abdominal uh, adiposity or weight gain around the abdomen. They develop some insulin resistance and high cholesterol and triglycerides. It's great for managing the insulin resistance issues and leptin, right? Leptin is the, what makes you feel full and satisfied, so it helps manage all those things. Now, I do not recommend stopping medications or taking supplements instead of a medication, so you need to talk to your physician about those things. With that being said, berberine, I've made other videos on it with the antiviral and antiparasitic effects of berberine. I've actually made a three-part series on that where I go over dosages, timing, um, and you know absorption rate and all those types of things. I'll go ahead and link those videos below so you can watch those. But in a nutshell, berberine is the master switch. Today we're gonna to do part two on berberine. The last video I made on berberine was quite popular and we had a lot of good questions coming in. So I figured we'll make a video on it, okay? So we talked about how berberine affects glucose, uh, antiviral, antiparasitic effects, affects the gut function, uh, improves 
have tight junctions in the gut to improve leaky gut or intestinal permeability. So let's go into some of the questions that were asked on that video. So one of the first questions they asked was, dosage, how much, right? At the end of the day, the dosage is gonna be dependent on the individual patients, right? So I'm gonna put a disclaimer, right? You need to consult with your physician in order to know the right dosage for you, okay? With that being said, the average dose for a lot of people out there will be between 500 milligrams up to 3000 milligrams per day in divided dosages. So when a patient comes in and they have prediabetes, maybe 500 milligrams is enough to control that prediabetes. For some people, they will need 500 milligrams three times a day. And for others, they will need uh, 1000 milligrams three times a day. So it really is dependent on the patient and what kind of medications they're on, etc. So it is a disclaimer about uh, basically being safe, right? You have to be safe. So timing. Ideal time would be 30 minutes before meal, right? Because it affects glucose and it's a, it's a great way to prime uh, the gut. However, for some people, it can irritate the GI lining, right? In, on an empty stomach. So it's best to take it mid or right after the meal to have the desired effect. So 30 minutes before meal or mid or after the meal. That is the best way to take berberine. The other one is duration. How long can I take it safely? Well, the question is, are we having the desired effect, right? Are we reducing glucose? Are we reducing inflammation? Are we not impacting the liver? So it's important to do blood work, to look at your liver enzyme. Is it affecting or impacting the liver negatively? Is it doing what we want with blood glucose, right? So it's important to modulate or monitor uh, your blood work in order to know the duration. They've had many patients have taken it up to over two years without any detrimental effects, right? And in fact, uh, they actually have positive effects, right? It decreases blood sugar, decreases their lipids and cholesterol, and overall, they're healthier. So it really depends on the individual. And I would recommend uh, blood work every six months to monitor uh, how you're progressing. Drug interactions. Yes, there's going to be drug interactions. So that's why it's very important for you to consult with the physician who understands these drug reactions, right? For example, if you're on blood thinners, right, taking um, any type of supplement or even fish oil can impact how your blood clotting uh, factor will work. So if you're on blood thinners, it's important to know, right? And berberine can impact that. So you need to modulate that or let the doctors know that you are taking blood thinners uh, to make sure it's not problematic for that patient, okay? Absorption. Research says poorly absorbed, yet it has a profound effect. So is it that even though a small amount actually gets through to the system, that it has a profound effect? Or maybe the studies are maybe uh, incorrect. I think it's a matter of just even small amounts can make a profound effect on someone's health, right? Because they've done studies and it reduces cholesterol, right? Reduces sugar, right? Improves oxidation uh, or antioxidant effects and anti-inflammatory effects. So there's a lot of good benefits to taking berberine, even though the studies have shown that it's poorly absorbed. Now, there are ways to improve it, right? Uh, taking it with the meal or mid-meal to absor uh, improve absorption, taking it with a medium-chain triglyceride or MCT uh, oil may improve absorption of berberine. So there are certain things you can do to improve that. Uh, there are actually even thinking about using IVs, etc., to help uh, have a significant impact on berberine. Okay, so this is these are the questions that we had, and although the my answers are not clear cut because it's really individualized. Uh, here are some basic guidelines. And again, consult with your physician before taking any type of herb, okay?
So let's get into how berberine, berberine can work, right? If we look at this, berberine will impact AMPK, which is 5-adenosine monophosphate activated protein kinase. Big word, right? What does it do? Essentially, this is a metabolic master switch. It creates a homeostasis of sugar and lipid balances, right? So it impacts, the AMPK will impact hypothalamus, improving or balancing appetite or decreasing appetite. So it will help balance the hypothalamus to affect appetite, to normalize, to make it a homeostatic uh, process. Muscle, muscle energy burning, right? It will impact that. Liver, liver synthesis, balance of your fatty acids and triglycerides. Right? It affects the pancreatic uh, cells, the beta cells of the pancreas. And pancre uh, the beta cells produce insulin. And that's how it impacts insulin and how it impacts blood sugar. Also adipose tissue, fat storage, and glucose uptake in the cells. So the AMPK will impact all these different things and becomes a balancing master. It's a master switch, right? So AMPK is impacted by berberine, right? So if you have berberine, that impacts it. But there are some things that you can take that makes it work a little bit better, right? Things like rosehip, burdock root, alpha lipoic acid. Things you can do naturally is some sort of calorie restriction or a intermittent fasting can also stimulate AMPK and then vigorous exercise, right? So you can do some things naturally to stimulate this enzyme. It's not just about taking supplements, right? A couple other supplements that can uh, be helpful is resveratrol and curcumin, right? Those supplements combined can have a profound effect on AMPK, helping balancing all of these and having a global effect on how um, the berberine or other supplements can have a profound effect on AMPK and overall health, right? So it's a lot to take in and there's a lot of information coming out, but berberine has been well studied in terms of glucose modulation, um, anti-inflammatory um, uh, effects, and overall health uh, benefits. Today, we're gonna to do berberine part three, the antibacterial, antiviral, and glucose management supplement. We're gonna talk about two things. One is interactions or adverse reactions, and the other one is absorption. So let's get right into it. Adverse reactions. For some patients, it can create some reflux signs and GI irritation. So it's important to look out for those symptoms. Some people, it can create constipation, nausea, and vomiting at times, and then hypoglycemic events. Hypoglycemia uh, runs in a lot of different patients. So if you take berberine and if it improves insulin sensitivity and decreases blood sugar, your hypoglycemic symptoms may get worse. So with hypoglycemia, what do you feel? You feel lightheaded, dizzy if you miss a meal. If you, you can get angry if you miss a meal. Uh, or you're that person who goes, I never miss a meal because I don't feel good if I miss a meal. So hypoglycemia is a real phenomenon with blood sugar dysregulation. So it's important to look out for signs and symptoms. The more important one is inhibition of cytochrome P450 3A4. It's an enzyme found in the liver and the intestines. It helps to break down or oxidize toxins and drugs out of our system. So if this enzyme is affected or inhibited by berberine, right, it's gonna affect the uh, metabolism uh, and excretion of toxins and drugs from the body, right? There are other things like St. John's wort, right? Also, metformin can also do the same thing and other drugs like uh, antibiotics or antifungals or certain blood pressure medications can inhibit this enzyme. 
So it's important to understand what type of drug you're taking and why berberine may interact with it. Now, this is in a very small percentage of patients, right? It really doesn't affect a large portion of these populations, but uh, you need to know when you're taking other medications that berberine can have that effect, all right? So the inhibition of metabolism of drugs or toxins or what we call xenobiotics uh, is very important. And this is not the only one. There are other enzymes that affect this pathway also. In terms of absorption, right, the clinical studies or uh, studies on you know, rats and, and mice show the bioavailability of love, less than 5%. But why is it so effective? Right? Small amounts that even get through can have just a profound effect on sugar regulation as metformin. So even the bioavailability is quite low, the effect is pretty profound in terms of sugar dysregulation and other cardiovascular effects. So why is berberine uh, not bioavailable, not readily absorbed? So berberine is subject to P-glycoprotein. P-glycoprotein is an important protein that's found in the cell membrane and that pumps out foreign substances, right? So berberine is affected by P-glycoprotein. P-glycoprotein will pump out berberine from the cells. So therefore affecting the absorption or usability or bioavailability of berberine. Now this pump is very energy dependent too. Right? It uses a lot of ATP. So in order to excrete these things out of our system, you have to burn more energy, making you more tired at times. Right? So what do we do? It's important to take berberine maybe mid-meal to avoid GI irritation or after meals. Okay? And take it with milk thistle because milk thistle will inhibit peak glycoprotein. Right? So that, therefore, berberine can be uh, more readily available or bioavailable. You can also take it with sodium um, capric or capric acid, capric acid, right? which is found in coconut oil. So what happens is uh, it widens the gap in the intestinal uh, tract in the, the cells, right? Paracellular transmission or perfusion or diffusion can occur. So it allows passive diffusion. So if you want to enhance the bioavailability, bioavailability, and you also want to enhance absorption rates, you can use milk thistle and coconut oil and MCT oil. Now a lot of companies actually come out with um, berberine with MCT oil, right? And you can also search for sodium caprate or capric acid uh, on our online store. So it's important to understand this and I get so many questions about is the adverse reactions, right? Why is the absorption so bad? How does it work? Well, this is how it works. And what you need to do is you need to individualize your treatment protocol. You have to be aware of these things. That's why we say talk to your doctor because they understand the drug re interactions um, with a lot of different medications, right? Or even your pharmacist. So it's very important for you to do that. All right. My name is Dr. Jin Sung, where clinical excellence meets excellent results. And we'll see you guys next week on the healthy side. Have an awesome day.